Thank you all, um, ladies and gentlemen, um, for your attendance this afternoon. Um, we'll uh, get uh, matters underway. Um, the first thing that I'm uh, required to do, or asked to do, is to remind you in relation to your phone, your mobile phone, not necessarily to switch it off, but to uh, render it silent, um, because you might be uh, motivated to tweet uh, in the course of the presentation, and if you would like to do that, the handle is at IIEA. So um, if it's just, as I said, immobilize or uh, uh, make sure that uh, your, your phone is in a mode where it doesn't uh, interrupt proceedings, if you, if you don't mind. So we're, going to, we're underway. Um, we'll go until about two o'clock um, or so. And as a normal practice here, our guest will make a presentation for 20, 25 minutes, and then we'll have an opportunity for a Q&A uh, session. The practice here is that the initial address of our guest is on the record um, and but that the Q&A session afterwards is under the Chatham House rule um, so that uh, as you'll be familiar with it if you're a frequent guest here um, you can use the information that you hear and that you pick up but it, we ask you not to reveal the identity or the affiliation of the speaker uh, or, or, or of any other participant that, that's just the Chatham House rule but you know we'll, we'll you know, we won't get too excited about it, but um, it, it sometimes does facilitate a bit more of a flow of information and discussion uh, in the course of the Q&A session. But as I say, the presentation is, of course, um, uh, on the record. Um, can I just, before I introduce our very distinguished um, guest and speaker this afternoon, welcome the uh, Ambassador of Norway, uh, Her Excellency Elsa Berit Eikland, uh, to join us this afternoon. Uh, you're very welcome and your colleagues from the Embassy and thank you for your support for this event uh, uh, this afternoon. Our uh, guest speaker, Christian Running Thomason, um, is the Chief Executive Officer of Statcraft, which is uh, Europe's largest producer of renewable energy. He holds a Master's of Science degree from the Norwegian Institute of Science and Technology and he previously worked with McKinsey's uh, and Norske Skog. He is a commissioner in the Global Commission on the Economy and Climate, uh, an international initiative uh, to examine how countries can achieve economic growth while dealing with the uh, risks posed uh, by climate change. We're delighted uh, to have uh, Christian here this afternoon. There's very much more that I could say about him, um, uh, but what I would prefer to do is, in, is was to introduce Christian, first of all, to invite him, I should say, to go to the podium to make your presentation, and we look forward very much to what you have to say, and then we'll have an opportunity for an engagement thereafter. So, Thank could you, you welcome, please, uh, Christian. It's a great pleasure for me to speak here at the Institute for International and European Affairs. Ireland has high ambitions in renewable energy and Statkraft as of now also has high ambitions here in Ireland. Some six months ago we acquired the Irish company Element Power and it was renamed now to Statkraft Ireland. So Ireland is now one of the selected growth market for us in Europe and also one of the important countries if you look at the total global portfolio that we have. And I can assure you this is not going to be a Viking raid. <laughs> In fact, uh, I want to start uh, with a few similarities between Norway and Ireland. Ireland has the 17th of March, St. Patrick's Day, and Norway has the 17th of May, where we both celebrate our independence and, and being free nations. Uh, we have both have small populations, around 5 million people uh, each, so we are of the same size. And throughout the history, both Norway and Ireland has uh, experienced to be controlled by a larger kingdom. Uh, we were for several hundred years under Denmark and then for almost 100 years under Sweden, both kingdoms, and, and we were the small brother in Scandinavia. We, uh, Ireland and Norway, both have a history uh, of poverty. We had both countries, where the, in fact the two countries in total Europe, where the highest number or percentage of people left to the US and Australia and elsewhere a bit more than 100 years ago. 
And since then, we have both developed into quite wealthy nations today. We also both love music. And um, uh, in the European uh, Song Contest, uh, together we have uh, 10 victories. Uh, I must admit, seven to Ireland and three to Norway. And uh, we also both love to talk about the weather. And uh, that is not without reason, uh, because Ireland and Norway are Atlantic coast nations. So we also have a lot of other things in common with, with shipping, fishery, and, and so on. Uh, but, but we are coastal nations, uh, both. And uh, climate change is uh, one of the biggest threats of our time. Uh, the, the sea level is rising every year. And um, we can expect stronger storms, more uh, intense rainfall. Uh, we see it already in Norway, and more flooding. This uh, uh, picture was, was taken uh, at the coast of Ireland one and a half year ago in a storm called uh, Eleanor. And uh, to me, this is, this is frightening. It, it's also one of the reasons why I uh, accepted to be a, a part of this global commission, uh, to, to see what really can be done uh, to do something about uh, climate change. It is probably in this century, the biggest threat we have uh, for the planet. It will lead to migration of people and a lot of secondary effect that we have only seen the beginning of. Uh, the reason behind the climate change is dominantly related to energy. 73% of all emissions leading to climate change stems from energy throughout the different sectors. Energy in transport, energy in <coughs> heating houses, energy in industry, and so on. Um, the uh, other 27% uh, are related to, to land use, agriculture, process-related industry, uh, and some other uh, areas. So, uh, in order to address climate change, we need to address how we use energy. And very fundamentally speaking, it can boil down to two uh, things. It is how efficient we are in using energy, so to use energy more efficiently, and secondly, to make sure that as big a portion of that is renewable. And one can add nuclear for, for those with the nuclear, but the most important is the renewable. I do not believe in a future where people will stop using energy. We can reduce to some extent how people travel and, and a little bit the way we live, but fundamentally the future generations will continue to use energy. So we need to ensure it's done efficiently and maximize the share of renewable energy. That is how reduction are going to be com come down. And luckily, uh, this is uh, uh, the costs of renewable technology, they are coming down faster than what uh, we in, in Startcraft and many others had expected. In fact, solar uh, panels have declined in costs close to 90% over the last 10 years. And likewise, uh, onshore wind, around 70% cost decline in the same period. So as of today, either onshore wind or solar or both are the cheapest uh, sources of new capacity available in more or less every country on the, on the world. One of them or both. In some countries, like in India, new solar even compete with existing coal and gas on costs. So some of the oldest and less efficient coal plants in India are out-competed now from new solar. What it means is that we expect in Startkraft that renewable energy will take a dominant share of all electricity produced in the world in the next two decades. All the blue uh, areas here, from the dark blue, which is hydro, 
uh, up to the 200 top, which is wind and solar. All that combined is renewable energy. And this is our low emission scenario. And in this scenario, it uh, constitutes 7% of all electricity produced in energy terms, in terawatt hours. If we, if, if we took it in megawatts, it would be even much more uh, a share because the production hours are less for renewables. But this is energy. At the same time, coal <coughs> declines, while gas, in fact, stays, may even uh, increase a little bit, and oil declines. This is our low emission scenario. We have one other scenario, a base scenario, where it is still 50%. And my view of the future is, is somewhere between the two scenarios, between 50 and 70% of all electricity. Here in Ireland, you have a target of 70% in 2030. Um, so you are a bit ahead of this, but you are not alone. The whole world is going in the same direction. Today, uh, we have energy consumption on the planet, which is about 81% fossil and about 14% renewable. We expect, in the same scenario I just showed for electricity, that this translated into total energy uh, will develop uh, into more use of energy because the population on the planet is still increasing and wealth is increasing and energy use is increasing, well, total energy consumption increases. But it is, to a large extent, offset by more efficient use of e energy, and most of that is coming from replacing um, combustion processes, fossil processes, with electricity. And electricity is much more efficient. So, uh, still, fossil fuel in this scenario will constitute 59%. This little less than 60% of all energy used, but it's less than 81, and it is absol in absolute terms also less than today. What will decline the most is coal, gas uh, uh, will increase a bit, and oil will go down. This scenario was not constructed by us to reach any specific target of uh, temperature rise, but it happens to uh, be, be equivalent to two degree scenario but it was constructed as a, as a trend extension on the existing technology development going on. If we are going to reach one and a half degree scenario, there needs to be even faster and more shrinking of use of fossil energy than this scenario shows. And that will hit coal even more, oil even more, and to some extent gas. But gas will be the one to, that we need the most, the less emissions per unit of energy, and what will remain for the longest time. Coal will be phased out uh, the earliest. If we look on a capital uh, aspect of energy, global investments in oil and gas is a little bit more than 700 million, uh, billion US dollars per year. And um, uh, in electricity, including networks, is a bit more, around 750. So electricity as an investment class is no bigger than oil and gas upstream and downstream combined. If we look at, uh, at uh, and renewables is constituting around 300 out of the 750 billion US dollars. So it's a huge investment class already today. The distribution of the renewables is that 50% of all renewables in capital terms are solar panels on the planet. About 29% uh, wind and hydro also a reasonable share of 14%, but solar alone is half. Wind is the second biggest. Uh, in fact, the installation rate of solar panels today is equivalent to 27 new football fields of solar panels every hour today. We expect this to increase by three to five times uh, within the next 20 years. So an installation rate of between 150, uh, yeah, 100, 120, 100 and 250 football fields per hour. Uh, in addition to renewables taking a uh, higher and higher propor proportion of the 
electricity production, also electricity will um, migrate into other sectors than pure use of electricity as we know it today. It will start with the transportation sector. This is a picture of the new Mercedes uh, fully electric um, EQC that uh, is being, uh, a new plant is being built in Germany to produce that car. Stuttgart has entered into a contract with Daimler to supply electricity to this factory. Uh, and it is just one example of all new investments that are going on. It's also around 300 billion US dollars of investment plans into electric cars, if we summarize uh, the big car producers. We don't have an overview of all, but those that we summarized came to that number. Uh, it also means that we will need more uh, electric charging networks for the electric cars. In Norway, um, we had tax incentives already for some years that makes an electric car less expensive to buy than other cars. So in Norway, um, uh, more than half of all new cars sold now are electric. And in Oslo last month, it was 80% of all new cars sold was fully electric or hybrid electric, but, but the bulk of that was fully electric. I have just ordered one myself. I've moved from hybrid to fully electric and I will never buy any fossil car again. My sons and my daughters will never buy a fossil car. So uh, uh, this is going fast. We expect that on pure cost, uh, roughly by 2025, without any subsidies, it will be the cheapest to buy and the cheapest to own. And driving range will be a 400 kilometers plus for a normal small car, like the Tesla 3 today. So uh, charging of electric vehicles will also be important here in Ireland. Uh, there are also challenges related to this transition. Of course, there are possibilities and challenges. And uh, uh, the whole electricity industry globally is in a huge change process from uh, the good old system we know with the big old coal fire, gas fire, and the hydros that we're producing when needed into a new system where wind and solar will dominate uh, almost all markets. And um, we have to adapt to that. Uh, it means that uh, utilities like us, we have to change quite fundamentally from um, constructing a limited number of large power plants to, to a huge number of smaller plants, smaller wind parks, smaller solar parks, uh, battery projects and so on. So it, it's a different DNA in a company to, to do 100 projects at the same time rather than doing three or four. Um, also, uh, it means more distributed generation all, all around. Um, rooftops, ground mounted, small wind parks, big wind parks, there will be simply distributed electricity production many places. I expect <coughs> in the future when a new building is constructed, uh, it is a solar roof, simply. It's not the tiles we know today. And um, uh, it means also that uh, in the period where we are now, which is not 2040, it's 2019, it is important how we sell the energy. So we are still in a period where in, in uh, yeah, ground mounted solar on, on, so on the ground is fully um, competitive now with other sources of electricity from equator and in Europe up to southern Spain. Uh, this will increase uh, as technology gets further down, but as of today, solar still needs some incentives or some stimulation, so auctions are normal in Europe to, to get it in. Wind are fully competitive in Norway and Sweden without any subsidies now, but there can still be need for auctions in, in Ireland and other countries in order to have it deployed at, a, at enough rate. But it will also be without any need of subsidies <coughs> some years ahead. Right now, to, to how we sell the energy to, to sell power purchase agreement, PPAs, to companies or long electricity contracts are key to deliver on 
uh, this transition, it is not only a question of how we produce the electricity, it's how we sell it. Auction is one way, but to sell directly to the customers that want to source renewable energy is also a very important part of this transition. Um, another um, aspect of this change is illustrated here on a logarithmic scale on the i-axis. So the, the nuclear plants uh, are, are extremely large, big, expensive, takes many years to construct. Coal and hydropower, like in the middle, wind power less, and solar even, even less if it's a relatively small solar park. So it, it means that the scale and the, the scale of the investment and the time to invest has shrinked a lot. That means that there are many companies that can enter this market. It, it will not be dominated by utility companies like the nuclear industry and the coal industries. This will be enormous amount of investors from, from private persons just constructing a wind farm on their own farmland to uh, financial investors that don't know that much about energy, but, but they are investing anyway in wind and solar. It's simply more smaller and more easy to build. So that is also a huge transition from, from a few large uh, utility companies to hundreds of thousands of investors into this. Um, having said that, it is also a role for the new uh, for the good old um, companies like Startcraft, but not if we continue the way we did. We have to adapt, uh, be able to compete both on cost uh, and speed with the new players. It's also a truly international market. In Norway, in most European countries, South America, India, wherever we are, uh, there's a huge competition here between local and international companies, and that's good, but it's also tough. So uh, that's also uh, putting challenges on us and everyone else. Another interesting aspect is that uh, wind and solar produce electricity when there is wind and solar. We all know that. It's <laughs> not the big news. But the size of it is uh, interesting to observe. This is 2025. It is a study that we made together with the Bloomberg New Energy Finance for the Northern European countries. And uh, in North, the blue here are so-called dispatchable renewables. It's, it's hydro that we can control when to produce because we have storage magazines. But the red are intermittent, those that we cannot control. It says wind, solar and run on river hydro that produce when there is sun, wind and, and much water in the river. So the red part is still limited in Norway because we have so much hydro. But in Ireland, and that would be the same in the UK, Netherlands, Germany, Denmark. It's a huge share. This is in megawatts. But it means that the difference between a day with a lot of wind and a lot of sun with a, a night with no wind is that this red goes from full to nothing. So this blue, the dark blue and, and, the, and the light blue will have to take all the swing. Plus... Uh, de uh, uh, demand that can adapt and consume less electricity when there is less production. For instance, when we charge the electric cars. So th th it also takes a lot of uh, change to have a system that has to adapt to variation in production, whereas the good old traditional system was adapting to variations in demand. The technology is there, it works Okay, but there's a lot of IT and software needed to take that transition. It will going to be an intelligent transition. And that makes room for companies in Norway, in Ireland, and in like any other country early in this transition that we will develop software systems and uh, skill sets uh, to control all this that we start using ourselves and that can be exported. And with all the IT industry here in Ireland, I think this is an interesting aspect that can be um, a business of the future. Startcraft, we need to, we intend to be among the players that um, uh, will help out to handle this flexibility with 
uh, integrated systems of demand control, um, running flexible gas, not gas plants that we own, but with companies we cooperate with, um, and batteries. We have already taken an investment decision for the first large-scale battery here in Ireland, down in the southwest. Uh, in Germany, where we have been more years than here in Ireland, we have developed a system that we, called, that we call a virtual power plant. The, the virtual part here is, is that we connect a huge amount of power plants. We have around 1,400 power plants in Germany that are connected to our system and controlled by us, but we don't own any of them. These are wind parks, solar parks, dominantly, uh, but also some biomass plants and some hydro plants. So uh, this is all controlled from one control center in Düsseldorf. We can turn the angle of the blades of the windmills in microseconds to balance out the electricity production of 12,000 megawatts throughout Germany from one place. Uh, so it is important for renewable energy also to, to be intelligent uh, handled. And Stuttgart is market leader in Germany and in the UK, and also number three in India. And maybe we can contribute here together with uh, Irish producers to do some of the same here. A few words about Stuttgart uh, at the end here. Um, we are present in 16 countries. We are the biggest producer of renewable energy in Europe but we are by, by far not the biggest producer of electricity in Europe. The biggest is EDF in France. Uh, but, but we have more renewable than any of those. And uh, uh, we have about 19,000 megawatt, most of that renewable, but some of it is gas-fired in Germany. And we operate uh, 22,000 megawatt for others, the 12 I mentioned in, in Germany, plus, plus 10 more. So we actually now control more power stations for others than we own ourselves. Uh, and that, I think, is also a business model of the future, that we should use our skill sets uh, applied on more assets, um, like we see in, uh, uh, in other sectors, like Airbnb and so on. There are the, 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 the fastest growing companies in the world are those that are able to utilize assets of other companies or private persons with the owning an apartment for, for that matter. Uh, so we constantly need to adapt. A few interesting aspects in addition to the electricity, which is our main business, is that we are looking into data center developments in Norway, of course to be supplied with renewable energy, so it's a new customer class. And here we are behind Ireland. Ireland has been very active uh, for many years. We are followers there, but, but we are doing our job now. Hydrogen for transport. Uh, electricity in the future could be so cheap that we can produce hydrogen in a cheaper way than extracting it from natural gas if there is some price of CO2. Not extremely high, but, but a meaningful price of uh, CO2 will give that transition. And that, of course, will create a lot of hydrogen available for other purposes. And uh, we are looking into floating solar. We have a project in one of our hydro power plants in Albania. If we cover 4% of the surface of the reservoir in that particular power plant, we double the capacity. So we will have equally much solar capacity as hydro turbine capacity in the same plant. And of course, we're just holding back the water when there is sun. And therefore, we can, can have a, like a perfect mix in one plant. And the potential for floating solar around the world is huge. And it is today much cheaper than floating wind, for instance. And this is first generation floating solar. So I think this has a huge potential. Uh, we are also looking into biofuels, which is highly interesting for Ireland because uh, you have used peat and coal to many of your power stations that can be replaced by biomass, but that can also be combined with a mix of biomass and waste to produce liquid fuels. So the new energy companies of the future here in Ireland will be electricity and fuel producing companies, most likely both renewable. 
Um, here in Ireland, our ambition is to continue to develop onshore wind uh, based on element power, which is no Statkraft Ireland. We have about 40 employees here um, uh, from the, the good old element power people. Uh, but of course, we have integrated this into the total Statkraft system, so we are combining it with our purchasing power of windmills worldwide and, and other skill sets that we can add some extras to. But, but the people on the ground here in Ireland are, are Irish people, with, with a few others coming from the rest of the Statkraft system. We will be uh, aiming for uh, pro uh, constructing more batteries, to, to help up with balancing the whole system. We uh, will enter here with solar parks. We have 30 megawatts that we are uh, putting in for consent uh, not too long. Um, we will try the virtual power plant concept that I illustrated for Germany, small scale and then increasing here in Ireland to see if we can have it work here in the regulatory system of Ireland. Um, PPA, so that's power purchase agreement, the sales of electricity to customers here fully renewable, of course, and uh, new business development in various types, maybe biofuel in the future or hydrogen, and maybe learn something from you in the data center development. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, it's just uh, to make a point that also here in Ireland, I think electricity has a huge potential to come into other sectors of, of uh, society than <coughs> what is consuming electricity today. And that also uh, is leading way to a lot of interesting business development uh, in the country. N not only for yourself, but you, we all should start with ourselves, but for, for future export of uh, new concepts. Um, for instance, if you want to charge uh, with charging stations for electric cars, it is much more important to have good communication systems with apps on the telephones and directly into the car that tells you that it's a free space for you that uh, in the direction you are going so that you can actually charge your car when you get there, that you don't have to wait for half an hour for the, for the, for the car in front of you and that you can pre-order your meal so that while you are there, that it's ready for you when you're coming, and so on and so on. That is, that is equally important as the location itself, and more important, how, how we attract customers. And, and there could be other concepts as well that, that it goes far beyond uh, the technology of charging as such. So, uh, but wind is what is going to drive the change in Ireland from uh, a, a, a modest percentage to, to 70 percent renewable. It will be also solar, there will be other technologies, but wind will be leading. Onshore is the dominant source, that is where we are, but there will also be a large offshore development quite likely. Element Power has one offshore field of 500 megawatts. We will offer another company to take a leading role in that project because Statkraft sold all of our offshore wind business in order to focus onshore. But we will uh, help to develop that field outside Dublin here, 500 megawatts uh, to a successful project, but with another company lead. So, um, uh, let me just run, uh, close with what I started saying, that I'm very happy that Ireland has this ambitious strategy that you have. Uh, and we um, will be an important company here in, in Ireland. Um, and we are here to stay. Uh, Ireland is an integrated part of Statkraft. We will also learn uh, from Ireland. It is not, we don't have the mentality that we know the best of everything, but we will combine uh, what goes on here with, with uh, competence in other parts of the company. And I hope we can really contribute to Ireland becoming uh, a global leader in climate action uh, and in the development of renewable energy. Thank you. <laughs>